Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware. We have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit. But frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen, and I'm your resident Gryffindor. I'm Katie, and I'm your resident fill in the blank here. You were supposed to say Slytherin. I wanted to say resident sex kitten, but you wouldn't let me. Because I wanted to be the resident sex kitten. (sighs) Fine. I guess we can both be the resident sex kittens. (laughs) Okay. We're Ellen and Katie, your resident sex kittens. Yay! (laughs) And with that, we're just going (laughs) to keep rolling right into the rolling rehash. In our last episode, we compared Chapter 11 of Sorcerer's Stone, Quidditch, with the corresponding film scenes. We discussed all the sporty goodness that was Harry's first Quidditch match, complete with inspirational speeches, cheating bad guys, missing commentary, Hermione breaking all laws of physics, and McGonagall mentally patting herself on the back for taking a chance on the new kid. We also discussed Hagrid's affinity for crazy pets and the bomb-ass names he comes up with for them. Harry, Ron, and Hermione are now all very suspicious of Snape, and Wood is still sexy. Oh, Captain, my Captain. All of her Wood. Hmm. That's who I want to be a sex kitten for, just FYI. Fair enough. <laughs> During episode 11, all of her Wood. All of her Wood. <laughs> <laughs> We're in opposite land, what? Anyway, one Potter pondering was to wonder if Quidditch in the movies was how you pictured it when you read the books. Quincy thinks that movie Quidditch is better than book Quidditch. It is really fun to watch it come alive, though Lily Stewart felt the movies ruined Quidditch for her, that it wasn't how she'd pictured it in the books, and that it looked more childish. I can kind of understand that. We did talk about how they made it more about gratuitous violence rather than the blatant cheating. Not to mention the fact that uh, CGI totally looks like a video game. We have definitely (laughs) made some significant strides in CGI since then. Right. The other uh, was pondering on how you think, in God's name, Hermione got from one one side of the Quidditch pitch to the other side of the Quidditch pitch so damn quickly to light Snape on fire. Up and down all those stairs. A lot of goddamn stairs! Spoiler alert, it was not apparating. It was not. Very much not. And I am really pleased that nobody actually answered this with apparition, just to annoy me. Our keepers are nicer to me than you are. Probably because they don't know you that well. I'ma steal your line here. That's rude. Nah, I'ma steal your line then. You love me. I can't even argue that one, so let's just keep rolling. <laughs> Quincy had a good response for this one, too. He said, One can only assume she ran as fast as her little muggle-born legs could take her. I assume once she made it to the stairs, everyone was already seated and immersed in the game, so there wasn't really anyone blocking her way. That's not the issue, though. The issue is that there's a lot of goddamn stairs. Maybe we will just need to chalk it up to her being magic. Yeah, fine. (laughs) Our trivia question last week was... What does Dumbledore claim to see in the Mirror of Erised? The answer is himself holding a pair of thick woolen socks. I have thick woolen socks, just for the record. They're not, actually, they're not woolen, but they're, they're cute and they're thick. And that's relevant how? It's not. So, Let's just keep rolling. Okay. Congratulations again goes to Quincy, who is on a three-week streak, But we also have to give an honorable mention to Justin. Yeah, this was quite possibly my favorite trivia moment yet. Um, We had a little bit of a timing mix-up where the episode was supposed to post at midnight and the trivia question post was supposed to post at midnight 30. Instead, the episode posted at 11 and Quincy, who clearly couldn't lose his streak, decided to create his own post about the trivia question. (laughs) So I have to respect that level of extra and have to award the bonus points because Quincy spelled invisibility cloak as all one word. Yeah. Justin was the first person to respond on the actual post with the correct answer. And I want to be mad at him because he didn't take my side and post invisibility cloak as two words. But... As much as I hate to admit it, I can't actually be mad because 
the smartass that he is, uh, hilariously spelled out the code words Uh as not one word, not not two two words, words. but 17 separate letters. Yes, that was a thing. (laughs) Very diplomatic, a very diplomatic smartass. It was. I would like to think I would have had a little bit more... um, of his loyalty, considering I've known him since high school. But... Yeah, but he's a Gryffindor, and you're not. So that maybe is part of it. You know what? He was almost a Slytherin, for the record. Just so you know. Mm-hmm. Almost only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, not long after all of that went down, Carly showed up to answer it, too, and I'm loving it. We have the best keepers. We really do. Thank you so much for playing our trivia game. I'm now really looking forward to seeing if anyone can actually make it to the trivia question post before Quincy this Or before week. he makes up his own. Well, yeah. <laughs> he is going to be first. <laughs> he if is... it is the last thing that he does. Right. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I also think we should start keeping track of who answers the trivia questions and award house points for real. Oh, that's not fair, though, because there's more Gryffindors. Right now. There aren't any Slytherins. We'll get some Slytherins. But... Besides, it doesn't matter that much. You are a Slytherin. You've already even said your bonus points are worth more than mine. It's because they are. See? She's just going to give and take points arbitrarily anyway. It'll be fine. I feel attacked. All right. I. You know what? I need my support Hufflepuff. Carly, where are you? I need you. Carly is totally your... Carly is totally our support Hufflepuff. Seriously, I want to put her in a vest and take her on flights with me. Because, you know, she's my support badger. Oh my gosh. Carly, if we make you a support Hufflepuff vest, will you wear it? (laughs) We should totally design one and sell it in our store. That would be awesome. (laughs) Oh, I love it. Right? But we should just keep rolling. We really should. Chapter 12, The Mirror of Error Said, and its corresponding film scenes. Chapter 12, The Mirror of Error Said. This chapter starts off in mid-December, with Christmas getting closer and the first big snowfall. The Weasley twins are punished for bewitching snowballs to hit Professor Quirrell on the back of his head. Everyone is anxious for the term to end and the holidays to start. During potions class, Malfoy still tries to make fun of Harry for having no proper family and having to stay at Hogwarts for the holidays because he's upset that Slytherin lost the Quidditch match and that no one was amused by his jokes about Harry catching the snitch in his mouth. Harry is going to be staying at Hogwarts along with Ron and his brothers, but he feels like it's probably going to be the best Christmas he's ever had. When they leave potions, they run into Hagrid carrying a large fir tree and offer to help. Malfoy asks them, to get out of the way and then makes fun of Ron for being poor, causing Ron to attack him just as Snape comes up the stairs and takes five points from Gryffindor for fighting. Hagrid tries to cheer them up by inviting them to come check out the Christmas decorations in the Great Hall, and they all head that way. The hall looks amazing. Hermione reminds Harry and Ron that they need to get to the library, and Hagrid wonders why, so close to the holidays. Harry explains that they're trying to figure out who Nicholas Flamel is, and that he can just save them the trouble and tell them. He feels sure that he's read the name somewhere. Hagrid refuses to tell them anything, so the trio heads to the library. They had already checked a bunch of books and hadn't come up with anything, because the library is so big and they don't have any idea where to start. Harry wanders over to the restricted section of the library, where you need a special letter from a teacher to be allowed to read any of the books. Before he gets too close, Madame Pince, the librarian, shoos him away. Harry leaves and waits for Ron and Hermione in the corridor. They join him and talk about how they still haven't found anything. Hermione says that Ron and Harry should keep looking over the holiday. However, once the break starts, they are having too good of a time to do any research. Ron starts to teach Harry wizard's chess. Ron playing with his old family set and Harry playing with a set he borrows from Seamus Finnegan. On Christmas Eve, Harry goes to bed, looking forward to the next day for the festivities, but doesn't expect to get any presents. The next morning, he wakes up and is surprised to find a small pile of presents at the foot of his bed. He gets a wooden flute from Hagrid, 50 pence from the Dursleys, a sweater and fudge from Mrs. Weasley, and chocolate frogs from Hermione. There's one gift left, with an anonymous note. It is a fluid and silvery gray cloak 
that Ron identifies as an invisibility cloak. Harry tries it on and looks in the mirror, with his reflection showing his head suspended in mid-air. The note says it had belonged to Harry's father. Before he can dive too deep into thoughts about the cloak and his father, Fred and George show up, wearing their own Weasley sweaters with an F and a G on them. They make Ron put on his sweater and comment on how his doesn't have a letter. Percy walks in holding his own Weasley sweater with a P for prefect on it, and Fred and George force it over his head, pinning his arms to his side and insisting that he will sit with them today, not the prefix. Harry has a memorable and delicious Christmas dinner with tons of amazing food and wizard cracker party favors that far exceeds the muggle ones the Dursleys would buy. He ends up with even more presents from the crackers, including his own wizard chess set. After dinner, Harry and the Weasleys have an epic snowball fight, then warm up by the fire in the Gryffindor common room, play wizard chess, and eat turkey sandwiches. Despite being the best Christmas Harry has ever had, the invisibility cloak and who gifted it to him has been at the back of his mind all day. When everyone else goes to bed, Harry pulls the cloak out and inspects it again. He decides to try it out by himself for the first time and heads to the restricted section of the library. The library is very dark and Harry has to light a lamp to see where he is going. It looks very eerie to see the disembodied lamp floating along. He gets to the restricted section and looks at the books, selecting one at random and opening it. The book begins to scream a loud, high-pitched shriek and Harry slams it shut and takes off, but the screaming continues. He passes Filch on his way out and runs for it, ending up in a corridor that he doesn't recognize. To his horror, Filch must know a shortcut, because he soon shows up, reporting to Professor Snape that someone has been in the restricted section of the library. As they get closer to Harry, he carefully squeezes through an open door to his left, managing to get past without alerting Snape or Filch. Once they walk away, Harry looks around what looks like an unused classroom. He notices an ornate golden mirror with the inscription, Era said, Straw, Eru, Oit, Ub, Kafru, Oit, On, Husi. Harry approaches the mirror to check out his invisible reflection again, and is surprised to see not only his actual reflection, but a crowd of people standing behind him. He looks around the room again, but no one is there. He looks back in the mirror and at the people, and realizes that the two closest to him, a woman with dark red hair and green eyes just like his, and a tall, thin, black-haired man, are his mom and dad, and the others are all his family that he is seeing for the very first time. They all smile and wave at him, making him both happy and sad at the same time. He reluctantly leaves and heads back to his dorm. The next morning, he tells Ron all about the mirror. Ron's upset that Harry didn't wake him, but they make plans to go back that night so he can see Harry's family too. Harry is so distracted by the idea of seeing his family again that he can't even eat. That night, the two of them sneak out under the cloak to try and find their way to the mirror. Harry starts to worry that he won't be able to find it again, but they eventually do. They head to the mirror, and even though Harry sees his parents, Ron can't see them. Harry has him stand in front of the mirror, and his family disappears. All he can see is a pajamaed Ron, who sees an older version of himself as head boy, Quidditch captain, and holding the house cup and the Quidditch cup. Ron wonders if the mirror shows the future, but Harry shoots that down, pointing out that all his family is dead. He asks Ron to move so he can see his parents again, but Ron isn't quite finished and the two argue a bit until they hear a noise. They get the cloak back on just as Mrs. Norris shows up, and they head back to the dorm before she can get Filch. The next day, Ron tries to distract Harry with chess or visiting Hagrid. Harry can only think about the mirror. Ron warns him not to go back, though Harry doesn't listen. He finds the room much quicker that night and sits down in front of the mirror before realizing that Dumbledore is also in the room. Dumbledore tells Harry that he's not the first to discover the mirror of Erised and asks if he has figured out how it works. He says that the happiest man on earth would be able to look into the mirror and see himself exactly as he is, that it shows the deepest desires of our hearts. Harry has never known his family, so he sees them standing all around him. Ron has been overshadowed by all his brothers and sees himself standing alone, the best of all of them. Dumbledore explains that the mirror doesn't offer truth or knowledge and that it has caused men to go mad. He tells Harry that it will be moved to a new home and asks him not to go looking for it. Harry asks Dumbledore what he sees when he looks in the mirror. Dumbledore says he sees himself holding socks and Harry doesn't realize until he gets into bed that he may not have answered honestly. 
And now for the movie scene. The scene opens with a snowy exterior shot of Hogwarts and Hagrid dragging a large pine tree. Inside the castle, Hermione is walking into the Great Hall with luggage as some ghosts sing a Christmas song. Flitwick is magicking ornaments onto a tree and Harry and Ron are playing a game of wizard's chess, which Hermione finds barbaric as Ron's queen smashes Harry's knight. We learn that Ron's parents are visiting his brother Charlie in Romania for the holidays, so he is staying at Hogwarts with Harry. Hermione tells him that he can help Harry look in the restricted section of the library for information about Nicholas Flamel and wishes them a happy Christmas. On Christmas morning, Harry is awoken by Ron, who is yelling from the common room. Harry puts on his glasses and runs out of their dorm to find Ron in a maroon sweater with a big R on it. Ron explains that his mom made it and tells Harry that it looks like she made him one too. Harry is shocked and delighted to realize that he has presents and races down to open them. He opens a note that anonymously explains that Harry's father left this in their possession before he died and they were now returning it to him. The package contains what turns out to be an invisibility cloak. Ron wonders who sent it to him and Harry looks at the note again, telling him it only says to use it well. Harry uses his invisibility cloak to sneak into the restricted section of the library in the hopes of finding a book about Nicholas Flamel. He instead opens a book that horrifyingly screams at him and alerts Filch to his whereabouts. He accidentally knocks over his lantern in his haste to get away, but manages to sneak away under his invisibility cloak, avoiding Filch and his cat. In the corridor, he sees Snape confronting Professor Quirrell, telling him he doesn't want him as his, as his enemy. Snape seems to sense Harry's presence and reaches out towards him, but Harry backs away just in time, and Filch comes running up to the professors with the broken lantern, declaring there to be a student out of bed. Harry silently slips through an open door and quietly closes it. He finds himself alone in a room and takes off his Im invisibility cloak. The room is essentially empty except for an ornate mirror with a foreign-looking description. Harry looks in the mirror and is surprised to see two other people in the mirror as well. He realizes they are his parents and then rushes back to the dorm to wake Ron. Harry takes Ron back to the mirror to show him his parents, but when Ron stands in front of the mirror, he sees himself as head boy, holding the Quidditch cup as the captain and looking quite good. He wonders if the mirror shows the future, and Harry sadly tells him that it can't because his parents are dead. The scene then cuts to Harry by himself, sitting in front of the mirror and staring at his parents. Professor Dumbledore approaches and tells Harry that he, like many before him, has discovered the delights of the mirror of Erised and asks him if he figured out how it works. He tells him that the happiest man on earth would see himself exactly as he is in the mirror. Harry assumes that that means the mirror shows people what, whatever they want. Dumbledore clarifies that it shows them the deepest desires of their heart. It doesn't show knowledge or truth, and men have wasted away in front of it, even gone mad. He says it will be moved to a new home and asks Harry not to go looking for it, saying, It does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live. Both the movie and the book have the first big snowfall of the year happening now. But unfortunately, we don't get to see Fred and George Weasley bewitching snowballs to follow Quirrell around and hit him on the back of the head. I know, right? Which, funnily enough, is actually hitting Voldemort in the head when you think about I it. I know. <laughs> That's why I'm really sad they left it out. Right? They so needed to keep that in. The book shows the trio in potions class, where Draco Malfoy is making fun of anyone who has to stay at Hogwarts for the holidays, and by anyone, I mean Harry. Mm -hmm. Even though Harry is actually thrilled that he doesn't have to see the Dursleys. Yeah. And the movie doesn't show that, or when uh, Nazi von Douchebag II insults <laughs> Ron's family for being poor yet again. Right, yeah. Ron lunges at him, and it's right as Snape shows up. Of course. And Hagrid was also in this part of the book. He's carrying a large fir tree. He tries to stick up for Ron, but Snape was having none of it and does one of his favorite things ever, which is take points away from Gryffindor. My husband wondered if the other teachers just got in the habit of awarding Gryffindor extra points for random things to balance out Snape's point-deducting frenzy. Right? <laughs> yeah, none of that happened in the movie. Um, though we do get, we still get to see Hagrid with the giant fir tree outside the castle, lugging it in. The film basically starts in on Hermione heading to the Great Hall to say Happy Christmas to Ron and Harry, who are playing uh, the barbaric game of Wizard's Chess. 
This actually also ends up omitting the librarian, Madame Pince, Mm -hmm. because we don't get to see the trio looking for Flamel in the library and Harry get in trouble for getting too close to the restricted section. Yeah. It just skips all of that, so we never get to meet her officially. Yeah, the restricted section does get mentioned in the movie, though, because Hermione tells them that they haven't checked there yet and can do it over the holidays. Um, And Ron, I think... It's so funny, Ron's, like, picking up on the fact that they're they're really being bad influences, you know? Right, because she goes from, like, no, we can't break rules to not in the restricted section. Yeah, like, she goes from, like, a hall monitor to, what what is that, neutral good or chaotic good? She's, that might be chaotic good. Yeah, she's a little chaotic good. She goes from lawful good to chaotic good. Yeah. Pretty much. But yeah, so it's it's kind of funny, and Ron's just like, I think we've had a bad influence on her. And it's like, well, yeah, you're Ron, so yeah. you would. <laughs> and she does tell them to keep researching over the holidays in the book, too. Another minor difference between the two is on Christmas morning in the book, the presents are at the end of the beds, and then the movie has Ron yelling at Harry from downstairs to get his presents from under the tree. Mm-hmm. I think that's because... Uh, Chris Columbus is American, and uh, presence under the tree is more of an American tradition. You know, we talked. Oh yeah, we talked about that in our in our Christmas episode. Yeah, they're, they're at the end of the bed for British kids, and under the tree for American yeah. That's what they kids. did with the with birthday presents too. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, but not in America. <laughs> Sad. Uh, we go under the tree. Also, Ron was wearing his Weasley sweater in the film when Fred and George have to convince him to put it on in the book because Ron hates maroon. That and the movie uh, had the letter R on his sweater. He wasn't supposed to have any anything on the sweater. Right. It was just supposed to be a maroon sweater. And it gives, in the book, um, there's a joke that George makes uh, about how, like, Ron doesn't have a letter. And he's just like, Mom must not think you forget your name. But we're not stupid. We know our names are Gred and Forge. Oh, I love Gred and Forge. <laughs> I love Gred and Forge. I know. Oh, I wish they would have kept that in. I like, though, I like that they all had letters on their on their yeah, sweaters, I mean, though. it was just it was cute, but it wasn't like they specifically state that you've got Fred and George, so she can tell them apart, and you've got P yeah. for prefect. Ron didn't have a letter. They comment on that, like it just yeah. when there's a specific comment that there's no letter on yours, and then they add a letter on it. I don't get why. I know, but it was just kind of I don't know. There's something because I know Harry's didn't in in the book obviously he didn't have an h on his but he did in the, in the movie. movie yeah they they lettered all of them for the movie yeah, which the, they, didn't, they didn't really show him in the movie yeah it was the deleted scene that we saw yeah they get mentioned in the deleted um, scene i but, think you see it later too but you, it's not like mentioned as a weasley sweater like he's wearing it just around yeah no i don't think they later. ever specifically call them weasley sweaters in the movie no. that's just what we all know they well, are yeah. but like i Although, i like the side note what they actually probably call them jumpers, not sweaters, and that's just another Americanized thing. Sweater, jumper, whatever. I want one. Me too. I want one. Facts. I should work on figuring out how to knit one of those. I'll have to add that to my list of things that I'm working on making for this podcast. <laughs> the six mile long list, yes. Uh, yes, it has gotten quite large. But, right. Um, but, I'll... The, but the thing is, I really want to bring this up. <laughs> bring it up. I really want to bring this up. I was saying that I like that Harry had the H on his because it showed that Molly just didn't, it wasn't just a sweater that was laying around. Molly made that for him. And Harry's never had someone make something yeah, for him. It's definitely like, really sweet. It was, it's just It is kinda, a very Molly thing to do. Mm, it, it, hit, it hit me right here. Yeah. Not my boobs, but my heart. Underneath my boobs. <laughs> Anything going towards your heart would have to get through your boobs first. <laughs> It's got a long way to go. Let's just keep rolling. <laughs> also in the novel, Harry receives a wooden flute from Hagrid, 50 pence from the satchels of assholes. Yeah. A sweater from Molly Weasley, which we just mentioned, and a large pack of chocolate frogs from Hermione, as well as the invisibility cloak with an anonymous mm-hmm. note. Yeah, none of that was in the film, obviously. It was just the cloak entirely. As another side note, because we're doing side notes today, it's our thing. But 50 pence was actually the answer to our trivia question from our Christmas episode, where we asked, 
what the Dursleys gave Harry that Christmas. It was 50, 50 pence. Yeah. Great which gift. he then gave Ron. Because Ron thought it was so weird. Yeah. That's money. What a shape. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of makes me wonder what shape galleons, galleons and, stuff and, are, yeah. and sickles and canuts are because yeah. I was just under the impression that they were all pretty round. Well, I mean, and, and that's how they show them everywhere. Right. Maybe, maybe they're shape? more like oval or maybe, I don't know. hexagonal. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway. Yep. In both, Ron suspected that the cloak was an invisibility cloak and then mm-hmm. confirms it when Harry puts it on and his body disappears. Thank God Ron figured out that Harry got an invisibility cloak or we might have thought Harry's body was really gone. Right. My body's gone. Thank like, God. Really, Harry? You can't still feel it? Good call for you, Ron. Way to bring it all back for us. <laughs> Another minor difference is that in the novel... Harry reads the note after he tries on the cloak, but in the film he reads it first. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know how much of a difference that makes at all. Yeah, also in the in the film, the last line of the note was uh, supposed to be a very Merry Christmas to you, and that wasn't included. just said, use it well. Use it well. I wonder <laughs> if the Philosopher's Stone says a very happy Christmas to you. I don't know. Probably. Yeah. I'd imagine. Um, the film also cuts the rest of Christmas. We don't yeah. get to see the feast, the wizard crackers, Dumbledore in a pink flowered bonnet, oh, or anything. I, I know! <laughs> it just goes straight to Harry using his cloak to sneak to the restricted section of the library that night. Yeah, when he completely negates using an invisibility cloak by holding a damn lantern outside of it. That basically happens in the book, too, because the library was dark. So it makes me wonder, would a lamp work properly behind an invisibility cloak? Or, like, would he just light underneath the cloak and be useless beyond that? Like, it's making everything invisible, so does it make the light invisible, too? And if the light's invisible, can it go beyond the cloak? Yeah. I mean, I get what you're saying. I just... I don't know. I think lanterns in general are just insane to use, I think. Well, that's a whole magic thing. They're not supposed to be able to be around electricity. It's it's an aesthetic. You know? That's what they got going. And that's fine. Well, no, historically... Magic and electricity do not mix well. Yeah. Which, that's what you gotta do, I guess. So, lanterns. Yeah. Torches. Until he learns Lumos. Until he learns Lumos, which has not happened yet. No. But yeah, it's... it's. I feel like this scene in the film stayed... It stayed pretty true to the book. Even if they did add some extra drama by including the face. The screaming face coming yeah. out of the book. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess that makes sense for the sake of a film, though. The screaming face popping out of the book makes a really cool visual. Yeah. And that's kind of necessary for interesting films. You want yeah. it to visually look appealing. Mm-hmm, for or sure. else why they, watch it? They, they do change the scene a little when uh, Harry manages to get away from Filch in the library. Yeah, because in the f- book, Filch must know a shortcut. And he shows up not far from where Harry ends up. Mm-hmm. He also has Snape with him and is reporting to him that someone was in the restricted section. Yeah, and in the film, Harry basically just runs right into Snape confronting Quirrell, who looks his usual squirrely self. Yeah, I don't know why. I wouldn't mind being pushed up against a wall by Alan Rickman. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, beyond that, how Harry finds the mirror of Erised in the movie is pretty spot on to the book. Yeah, the mirror even shows the inscription at the top of it mm-hmm. The that looks like nonsense. The era said, stra, eru, oit, ub, kafru, oit, on, usi. God bless you. <laughs> Which I'm sure a lot of people figured this out, but it's actually just written in reverse and then broken up at random places. And it really says, I show not your face, but your heart's desire. Yeah. But just backwards. Which I thought was neat. It's a fun way to kind of create a new language. Just Mm -hmm. write what you want backwards and break it up in new places so it's still kind of readable. Like, I can still look at that sentence and pronounce it. Yeah. It's nonsense, but then you look and it's just a simple way to give you something backwards. Mm Mm-hmm. That's Da Vinci. Da Vinci used to do that with his with his uh, journals. Well, he would just write. Well, it was yeah his it was letters backwards. backwards, so people couldn't. read But he it. wouldn't break it up in. Yeah, into he still just did the words. words. He yeah. just. It's tough to do that too. Mm-hmm. So. Oh yeah. Genius. But yeah, when Harry first looks in the mirror, the only real difference is that in the book he sees his parents and other family members. When in the film, he only sees his parents. How sad is it though, that. 
Harry has never seen his parents before the mirror of Erised. Like, he didn't n- even know it was them at first. Right. He's never seen a picture. He's never... Like, How? it's... That's so sad. It's horrible. And I can't blame him at and all. He, and he grew up with his mother's sister. Like... Who is a... Mrs... Purse of assholes. A purse of assholes. <laughs> She's a handbag of assholes, is what she is. <laughs> a handbag of assholes. <laughs> like, how? I mean, I'm sure she, with everything that went down with Lily, I'm sure she probably got rid of a lot of pictures and stuff. But Would she get rid of get... him? I feel like she hit him somewhere. She hit him in the attic yeah. or something. But I'm saying, like, like, that is still her never... sister. How do you never show your kids your. your because she's a your handbag of assholes. Kid. But how it's you... shitty. Ugh. And really it sad. It makes me more mad. Yeah. When you stop and you're like, wait a minute. He had no idea those were his parents. Like, it took him a hot minute. Sad and mad. And I can't blame him at all for becoming so obsessed with the mirror. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, in the movie, though, after realizing who it is, he, like, immediately runs to get Ron. Yeah. Right? And take him back to the mirror, like, that night. Seriously, Yeah. Like, here's an idea, Harry. You know Snape, Filch, and Quirrell are all looking for a student out of bed. Go get Ron and risk them finding two students out of bed. No one ever said that Harry was smart. Remember? Mm. Hermione saying, what an idiot. And everything working out okay anyways. And Harry doing something very brave and very stupid pretty much sum up the series. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, the movie kind of montage is this section as well showing at least three different times that harry was at the mirror but then nothing in between there's nothing going on otherwise right in the book ron's trying to convince harry to play chess or visit hagrid and harry can only think about the mirror Mm-hmm. yeah we were we were talking about this before too this was actually the deleted scene in the film and it yeah. also it show, it's got everyone in their weasley sweaters. right and that would fall in somewhere in this montage type thing they did i bet they felt like it didn't really fit in since it was just like harry's at the mirror harry brings ron to the mirror harry's sitting sadly in front of the mirror dumbledore appears yeah and like at what point i i mean obviously it would have fit in between harry taking ron to the mirror and before that last time Mm -hmm. that harry was just sitting in front of the mirror before dumbledore comes to speak to him but i think they probably felt like it broke it up too much See, I would have liked it, though. But I would, I would have, have liked have the too. continuation of seeing Harry, like, wishing he was at the mirror. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, and and it, was, it was really sad. Like, you could tell mm-hmm. in that moment that this was something deeply affecting Harry. Not yeah. that you didn't get that feeling seeing him sit in front of it, staring at it the way that he was. But, but to see him even outside of that situation... With the same look on his face. Right. And no and mirror. To see how much it was yeah. affecting him, just staring in the fire. Mm-hmm. Um, also, it, you said they showed those sweaters. Yeah. The, the Weasley sweaters, sweaters in that yeah. scene. Uh, they got most of the colors wrong. They, yeah. Because Fred and George's are supposed to be blue with a yellow letter, mm-hmm. and Harry's is supposed to be emerald green, and also not have the letter, which we talked about before. But I digress. <laughs> yes, Hermione. Yeah, in both the last time that Harry visits the mirror, Dumbledore shows up or is already in the is room. already there. Who knows? They give the impression that Harry literally walks past Dumbledore and doesn't even notice him. Strange how nearsighted being invisible can make you. <laughs> yeah, and in the movie, Harry's just sitting in front of the mirror, and then Professor Dur- <laughs> shit, <laughs> Professor Dumbledore, <laughs> Professor Dumbledore, <laughs> Professor Dur- Oh my god. <laughs> He walks up behind him, and Harry's like, Oh my god, Professor Dumbledore! Oh my god, Professor Dumbledore! Oh my god! <laughs> this is maybe a little bit too funny to us. <laughs> I think we just found our episode title. <laughs> oh also, my god! Oh my god, Professor Dumbledore! <laughs> That's gonna be fun to figure out how to spell. Right? But also in the book... Harry asks Dumbledore what he sees in the mirror, and Dumbledore says socks. Yeah, that wasn't in the movie. But it was our trivia question. It was. From last week. Warm, warm But socks. it was another one of those moments that they took away from Dumbledore, because it's such a fun scene. Harry asks Dumbledore if he can ask him something, and Dumbledore's just like, well, 
you just did, but you can ask me something else. Yeah. <laughs> and like, <laughs> and so he asked them, and he's like, I see myself holding a pair of thick woolen socks. Another Christmas come and gone. And not a single pair. People will insist on giving me books. And you're just like... <laughs> I, I, like, it just gives so much more flavor to Dumbledore yeah. mm-hmm. that was really lacking from the movies. Yeah. And I'd like to see that quirky side of him where he lies to a kid saying that the thing he desires more than anything is socks. Yeah. Like, it's super quirky. Like, that's your response. But Harry doesn't even pick up on that. I was going to say. Until he's, like, well like, removed from the situation. Yeah. Harry, it doesn't even, like, strike him as odd. Like, Harry sees his family. Dumbledore sees socks. Yeah, that checks out. Right? Ron sees himself. wait a minute. (laughs) Ron sees himself, like, bigger and better than all of his brothers. Yeah. Dumbledore sees socks. Yeah. That attracts. Sure. I totally buy it. I buy it. Yeah. (laughs) We were not introduced to any new actors this time. No. So that just brings us straight to our Potter Ponderings. Or in this case, just Potter Pondering, because we only have one. Oh, sure. Now you'll go singular or plural. I always say code word. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anywho, <laughs> our Potter Pondering is, what do you think you would see in the mirror of Erised? I'd see Oliver Wood. Oliver Wood. Oliver Wood. Oliver Wood. Oliver. Uh, let's not start this again. And uh, now don't start that again. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make a Jungle Book reference for you. Well, it is one of the bare necessities of life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's just keep rolling right into our Sorting Hat story. This week, we are featuring one of our patrons' stories, Justin Reynolds. Justin writes, I had known of Harry Potter in high school, but didn't give it much thought until after a stint in the military. Loading UPS trucks the morning that the Order of the Phoenix was released helped feed my curiosity. It didn't take long to catch up even trying to stretch out the Order of the Phoenix, because waiting for the next book in the series was going to be a miserable slog. I was suspicious of the movies as well, waiting to watch them on DVD. I was just as impressed as I was with the books, often going back and forth mid-movie. My Patronus is a stoat. My wand is fir wood with a phoenix feather core, 12 and 3 quarters inches with supple flexibility. The sorting hat always takes me between Slytherin and Gryffindor. Pottermore doesn't give me a definitive answer, and due to recent events, I can't in good faith go back and try something a bit more solid. Because Pottermore makes me choose, I'd have to pick Gryffindor, but it's close, I'd say by 10 house points. I'm not saying that you made the wrong choice, Justin, I'm just... You look better in green. That's all I'm saying. I disagree. I like you in red. <laughs> Go Gryffindor. Yeah. Tee <laughs> But for reals, we are so glad to have you as a keeper and a patron. Yeah. Thank you so much for all that you do. You're really awesome. Really awesome. And this week's trivia question is, what curse does Malfoy use on Neville in Chapter 13 of Sorcerer's Stone? If you know the answer, head to our Facebook page at JKR Podcast and find the post. Comment under the post with the answer and the code words. Code word. Code words. Chocolate frog. Code word. Code words. The prize for the first one who responds with the correct answer and the code words. Code word. Code words. We'll get a bitch is a witch, motherfucker's a wizard, or a just keep rolling sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us. If you are an Apple person, you can do it through the Apple Podcast or iTunes app. If you don't have Apple, you can write a recommendation on our Facebook page. Then email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. If you would like to support us as a patron for extra perks, you can go to patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. Any support you can give is always appreciated. Also, just in case we haven't mentioned Quincy enough, we wanted to do one more shout out this episode for him to welcome him to our Just Keep Rolling Patreon family. Not only is he an amazing keeper who's really good at trivia that we're so happy to have, Quincy is also a soon-to-be published author. Yeah, his book, No Rest for the Wicked, goes on pre-sale January 17th, which will be the day this episode airs so today go look for his book i know i'm going to thank you again for joining us quincy 
And join us next week when we talk about Chapter 13, Nicholas Flamel and the corresponding movie scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just keep rolling. Thank you.